Um, all right, we're, uh, we're going to start a little bit early on this one because I'm sure we're going to get a ton of questions for the panelists uh, here. So um, again, thanks everyone for, uh, for, for joining. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm the co-founder of a company called Scalar. Uh, we've got an incredible panel here with uh, folks that have um, a lot of experience with, with OpenTofu. Uh, they will introduce themselves in just a second. But this is a panel uh, mostly for you, a little bit for me, but mostly for you, um, uh, to give the opportunity to ask questions, um, share stories of migrating to uh, uh, migra migrating from Terraform to, to Tofu, and just a sharing experience of operating at scale and, and with all the, the warts and all the issues of, uh, of, of uh, running infrastructure. So uh, with that, uh, Daniel, can you introduce yourself? And then can you introduce yourselves? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I'm Daniel. I'm um, from Berlin. I'm the former director of engineering for T-Mobility. So maybe you've seen our bikes or scooters around the streets in Europe. Um, now freelancing and um, just give them some background there. Um, T-Mobility is running Terraform at scale, was running at Terraform at scale. Um, more to that later. Um, 250 stacks self-service in Spacelift hosted by current client. We are nearly at 1,000 Terraform stacks um, also um, yeah, in, in, a, in a GitOps style. So I'd like to talk about that later with the panel, uh, other people here as well. Cool. My name is Steven Kutsia. I'm a senior platform engineer at Dentsu. Um, our team is running roughly 750 Terraform stacks um, and recently migrated over to a newer Terraform 157 and then with the bomb drop, we've now been looking at open tofu and migration. Hello, I'm Ronnie. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, I'm a software engineer for the last 10 years. And in the last four and a half, I've been switching hats between the DevOps hat and the and developer hat, which is something I really love. Uh, I'm working in N0 for almost two years and currently uh, part of the Open Tofu core team for the last four months. Good morning, guys. Uh, I'm Hugh uh, from Ireland. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Hestio. Uh, we do Terraform adoption and uh, we have a commercial infrastructure uh, library, uh, a module, uh, commercial module library. Uh, similar to Gluntworks, except that uh, it's very much for low code. Uh, using Terraform since 0 0.4, so a long time, unfortunately, <laughs> for better and in some cases worse. Um, we work primarily with large enterprise customers, and there are both technical and non-technical challenges that we encounter very often. Um, one of our customers, uh, a large uh, global company, is running approximately about 8,000 Terraform-based stacks. And what's interesting about the customers, enterprise customers, is that they often don't, um, they manage a, an incredible amount of infrastructure, but they do not iterate and update that infrastructure very, very often. That's simply the way they, they consume. So even though it's a, a, a huge amount of, of registry that, uh, artifacts that are managed, uh, it's it's not something that updates very often, and so the potential for breakage is significantly increased when we come back to visit those. Excellent, thank you. All right, let's get started. So, uh, Daniel, you're you're saying that uh, that you just led a, a, a large migration project. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that went? What was what went well and did did not? And let's start from there. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, to be honest, I did not let it, but uh, my former colleagues let it. Um, but they finished it, and uh, right in time for the Open Tofu day. So um, TM Mobility migrated everything over from Terraform to Open Tofu, without any problems. That's what they told me. Um, there was some quirks. Um, most, uh, or the one quirk was in the modules they hard coded the version which is to be used with that module of Terraform, and they used semantic versioning. So with the nice little tilde, and which gives you a range. It gives you a range of lower and an upper bound. So that broke because with Open Tofu it's now 1.6. They hard coded everything to be Terraform, whatever 1.5 or something. So this was the only change they had to introduce to stay with a recommendation, give a lower bound, don't give up a bound with your modules. So, and with that, um, yeah, um, Spacelift is already supporting the founding member of the Open Tofu here, so um, that was not an issue. So from their perspective, everything went absolutely well. And you might ask why. Um, they are looking into the um, um, state encryption. 
the private state encryption, the feature to come, um, because it's, um, everything is managed in one state bucket, but too many people have too much access to those state buckets, basically, and this is what they want to avoid in the future, so preparing the grounds for more security there. Um, awesome. Uh, what has been the rest of your, your, your experience with, uh, Stephen, maybe you want to talk a little bit about your experience, or? Sure thing. So we've been doing some, uh, quite a lot of research into this migration and um, testing a few stacks and things like that. And so far we've found we've needed no changes. Um, everything is just simply work from moving over. So uh, we may encounter an issue at some point. We haven't found it yet. Yeah, uh, same for us. Like we haven't really migrated everything, but every new project is obviously open tofu and we're starting to migrate existing projects. And until now, like, we've seen no issues. That's interesting um, in that it's, it's great that there's almost a one-for-one -one swap in between Terraform and OpenTofu. Um, and from a technical point of view, we would, we would see exactly the same. Uh, there's very little involved technically in making the switch. Um, where we encounter a lot of, of challenges with our customers are, it's really just simply around awareness. Like this is preaching to the choir. Uh, everybody here knows that Open Tofu exists. I hope. <laughs> um, but uh, a very common conversation that we have with many of our, our larger customers is that uh, Open Tofu is simply Open Terraform. It's a separate thing. It's not a HashiCorp thing. It is the name of the language, and it is also the name of the tool. There's a little bit of confusion there, but. Um, What's really interesting uh, about our engagement with customers is that there's, there's an awareness and there's a, a sort of a knowledge building exercise that we do need to go on. And as members of, of the community, I mean, it's, it's certainly our role to increase visibility of, of Open Tofu, just to reinforce that it's still Terraform under the hood. It's Terraform is the language, it's built, it's the same language, it's an easy swap to make, as we heard here many, many times. And just more to reinforce that it is, it is its own thing, and it just is, it isn't a complicated thing to do. There are some technical challenges, but you can do a one-for-one -one swap in and incur almost no overhead very, very quickly. And I think a large burden on, on us as community members is really just reinforcing more and more of that open tofu awareness. Really, really is. If I can respond to that, like, I think you're absolutely right. I, I've been in an open tofu meetup in Israel uh, a, mo a month ago or so. And like, yeah, there are so many questions, so many people uh, still not knowing uh, about open tofu, specifically about how the registry works. And I think that having the, the registry um, talk that Aurel and James did was absolutely amazing. And like as a core team, we're also discussing that how, how do we explain to the community that all the providers are there, all the models are there. It's really easy to add the stuff that are missing. Uh, it, it updates automatically uh, for new versions. And yeah, like that, that's part of our job to teach the community about that. So one thing that I'd actually like to mention, and absolutely, I come from a very open source heavy background and um, the word of mouth that Open Tofu has been spreading is fantastic and I absolutely love it. And I actually had the same conversation recently about not many people know it and especially those in senior leadership who may not be up to date with the latest versions and everything like that. I actually made a joke this very week where I said what we need to do is we need to start Open Tofu from version 10. Because then all we have to do is say look it's 10 versus 1, it's much newer, it's better. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, honestly, I'm, I'm talking also to peers and also to clients there. The main focus is on uh, long-term support, basically. So how is uh, the landscape evolving? How is it going to support it there? Are the providers staying compatible? Um, is, um, are these two branches going um, apart? Um, whatever. So that's the thing. And um, also looking into new features and maybe um, iterating back here to Ronnie then. Um, what um, also my colleagues at Tier Mobility said, this is something they are really interested in and this is where the community actually has a chance to bring new features and this is sadly something which we 
could um, look back into the past years, um, there was not many features um, actively pushed into, into Terraform and now there's a chance and there are new features rolling out now. So, Ronnie, how are you actually deciding what to implement? Okay. Uh, then maybe like you, you touched a little bit about state encryption beforehand and I think it's a really good opportunity to say that we released an alpha just a few days Whoa. ago. Oh. <laughs> 1.7 and it includes uh, the state encryption and, and you should try it and see how it works and break it please please break it uh, but uh, yeah how how we decide about features then mainly it's it comes from the community um, we're going over each and every issue uh, we're pruning issues uh, at least once uh, a week and we're seeing what, what people are opening, and we're seeing how many upvotes uh, these features have, and basically that, that's how we decide. Uh, we're really trying to push the stuff that the community wants. It's, uh, it, it's super encouraging to see how the uh, one, uh, that the migration has created basically zero issues for, for, for anyone, uh, and two, how the open governance pro process makes it much easier for the community to suggest things. Um, what, what do you think uh, Open Tofu needs to grow uh, when in your conversations with, with, with folks? Uh, how can we make the community grow faster? What, 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 uh, what's needed? Stephen, you want to start with that? Sure thing. Uh, so growing Open Tofu will largely be an organic, it will be an organic event. Um, and it's already happening. Uh, open Tofu success story is writing itself. And the more we succeed and the more people learn about it, and the faster things will get. And you will have to prune faster than once a week because we're going to start getting, seeing more and more requests and more hopeful uh, community involvement on writing that code. Sorry, just to come in on that. Um, what I thought was, was really interesting about the community involvement uh, was in terms of, of new features, uh, state encryption I know is, is a big ask uh, for many, um, but what I thought was really interesting was something that James had touched on this morning. Uh, don't panic, James, it's okay. Um, he touched on this morning uh, in terms of just building the registry and hosting it. There was something that, that really struck a chord with me, and that was that the example that he gave was the the cloud posse uh, utility provider that merges two YAML files. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's downloaded approximately 47,000 times a week. Now, I'm sure James knows that, having had to serve it and build it. Um, but what's really interesting to me uh, as, a, as a builder of, of uh, components or Lego, if you will, that we want our customers to use, whether that's providers or modules, patterns or examples or reference architectures, is that that, that, that capability alone of merging two YAML files, that's been an open PR in Terraform for a long time. And if the entire community is having that problem 47,000 times a week, uh, that's definitely going to be something I would like to see us all upvote uh, over the next couple of weeks. And it's not only YAML, it's HCL as well. So there is no deep merge for maps. Even better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's just interesting to see that, uh, you know, security is obviously a big concern. And given the, what you can do with access to Terraform State, given that it's generating credentials for many of the services that, you know, all of the workloads run on, it's obviously one of the most important things. But um, I think it's important also that we ensure that the community of builders are also uh, getting more of the things that they need. And I think that brings us sort of back to what we'd had in an earlier conversation around, um, you know, Terraform as a language. Is it is it a DSL or is it slowly creeping its way towards a, a programming language? Um, yeah, what's your take? <laughs> Uh, so I, I like we talked about it a little bit, and I re I really tried thinking about it because I was a I was a developer that mainly worked with TypeScript, and I had to learn Terraform four and a half years ago, like in a month, and had to learn Kubernetes and Helm, like and and all of that, and like I was really trying to um, to remember how it was for me, like learning the DSL, 
And I, I honestly think that the fact that Terraform is a DSL, it's, it's domain-specific language, it's not an issue. Like, probably when I wanted to do like some kind of an if, uh, then I just went to Google and, and searched how to do that in Terraform. And then I saw the count syntax, and I was like, okay, that's weird, but okay, manageable, like, why not? I think the issue um, with Tofu and Terraform for developers specifically learning uh, how, to, how to use the language is not the language itself, not the DSL specifically, but it's more understanding the provider's ecosystem, understanding uh, how the cloud infrastructure works, uh, learning all of that, that's the real issue uh, in, my, uh, in my opinion. And like, I think Terraform being a DSL and Open Tofu being a DSL is really convenient. Like I change a property, an attribute of a resource, and I can imagine how the plan will look like. Uh, same thing happens uh, when an unplanned change happens. It's really easy for me to go back and understand where it, it explicitly happened. Um, so yeah, that, that's my take. I think it's really convenient, but that's not up to me. That's up to the community where Open Tofu will go to. So how do we, how do we help them do that? So how do we help them do that? What, what would we ask of the community to help us do that? To pick the, to pick the right next things? How do, we, how do we do that? I think it's just opening issues about things that bother them and upvoting and, and engaging, and that's how we know that, that you want something. That's how we know what we should focus on. Uh, and yeah, and, and teaching the community to do that. It's also not that easy to, to expect people to do that. They need to learn the process. Dan Daniel, you have a... Mm, just asking, I mean, uh, you're talking about um, issues and upvoting. Um, how about contributions? Um, a, how easy is that to contribute to the core? And B, is it welcome uh, from that perspective, um, especially deeper, like replay or introduce an if statement, finally, if else, to make it more complex? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, when we're pruning issues, then we're definitely uh, coming with a state of mind that we want to, if we want to accept that issue, and we usually do, then if we can, we want to open it to the community. Uh, people are amazing. The community is amazing. They're jumping over everything <laughs> that gets uh, accepted. And it's amazing to see that. And is it easy? Um, I'm not entirely sure it's easy to contribute. Uh, like as a person who, who dived deep in, uh, into Tofu for the last four months, like I, I'm also still learning. Uh, but I think there are people in the community that have a lot of knowledge and we should, we should learn from them. So sometimes like we, we um, open an issue uh, for contributors uh, about really internal stuff and we get pull requests and, like, and then we also have to learn uh, about, how, about the solution and uh, about the, the, the specific internals. And I think it's welcome. It's the best way to learn. And if I may say, that, um, that, that request and issues is actually for me the most exciting thing about Open Tofu, because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about all the pain points you know I've had over this time and someone will actually take me seriously on like if I would really like something. Um, even down to the silliest thing, like not being able to use counts in outputs. I've got multiple resources on count, why can't I create an output for each of those as well? But now I can. Now someone will listen, and I, that'll be you. So on that topic, um, what, what are, what's on your wish list? Uh, what are some of the things you'd like to see in 1.8 and, and forward? Hugh, you want to start with that one? OK, in less than two hours, right? <laughs> um, so I would, like to see, I would like to see Merge properly bought, brought into uh, Tofu natively. Uh, having to download something 47,000 47, times a week it, for me is a real indicator that that should just be baked in. We have merge, but it's, we can't curse, so I'll just beep. Um, but it, it's a really horrible experience as a module developer and an infrastructure coder. It's, it's horrible because it's very, very limited. So 
the fact that so many of the community are using that one capability to combine sort of initial and user values and build a sort of combined map or dictionary of the, the real uh, target that we want to build against, for me, that's number one. Number two, I think, uh, if I'm allowed to second one, uh, would be to fix to bool. So by a show of hands, how many values do you think uh, are supported by the to bool function? To bool, to boolean, true and false. By a show of hands, hold up one or two hands, how many values do you think the to bool function actually supports? Well, we're all wrong because nobody's got three hands. It's <laughs> true, false, and null. Perfectly logical, right? Uh, and I think there are a lot of examples like that where the, the language itself, in having started out in HCL1 as a configuration syntax and having then got huge adoption like it did in the early days, you know, prior to 1.x, um, and then coming through to, okay, now we need to add some more programming, programming primitives, you know, the counts, the loops, the conditionals as those come in. And I think um, coming from, in our earlier conversation, uh, Daniel had mentioned that one of the, the really interesting observations he had was that Terraform, as a developer, Terraform is nothing like all the other languages that you learn in that there are constructs, there are types, there are primitives, there are conditionals, and not all of that is true in Terraform. And again, it's part of that sort of, that, that uh, challenge that, that Ronnie had mentioned there, where it's a target state language, not necessarily a fully evolved programming language yet. But I think um, how the community are actually using it is very much like a programming language. And if we decide as a community that that is how we'll use Terraform, then I think we do need to make sure that it behaves much more like a programming language. What about you, um, Stephen? Uh, what, <laughs> what about you, Stephen? Uh, what would be on your wish list? So number one item on my wish list is I've had to do some horrible things in the dark of night to simulate those if, else, if, and uh, <laughs> things like that. I would really like to see that in. It would, it would be nice to be proud of my work again. So, so uh, yeah, go ahead, Daniel, but then I have a, a follow-up. No, no, I, I can completely support that. Um, so nothing to add here. Um, it's more like an experience thing. So um, really nothing to, um, to do with the core language, but it's more like uh, how to use modules. I would love to have a chance to mark a variable as this is something you should think about. This is something you may think about, and this thing is really obscure. So leave it as a default. Um, only touch it at some point, um, just from a developer experience uh, perspective. So it sounds like you'd like for the uh, the language to evolve in, in, in particular directions. Do you, do you in, in addition to, to loops and conditionals, anything else? Not right now, not on the top of my head. Um, it's really like, um, coming from a platform team here. So I provide modules to my teams, uh, yep. to the developers. So how are they used? So um, um, better support in IDEs, better hints, um, better. So if you're using or accepting that module now, okay, what should be there as a variable already to be filled in? Because at the moment you have to look those up, at least in um, uh, JetBrains, I don't think uh, Visual Studio Code is different there, so more support on the usage of these things. The primitives, I don't know, it's, it's fine. These annoyances, when, uh, once they are gone, I think um, I'm kind of happy there, but now take it up to the next level. Um, and I'd just like to mention that whole idea of we may not have m more annoyances than BOSC 102 is what makes a community involvement such a fantastic thing because there are thousands of talented Terraform developers out there that you know work on these things and they're like if only we could do this one thing um, and all together if we all contribute and everything like that I think it'll be a, a really neat product. It will. I, I totally agree and uh, guys I, I'll wait for your uh, issue <laughs> submission by Monday okay. How large is your mailbox? Yeah. What? How large is your mailbox? <laughs> <laughs>
No, I think I, I don't get a third. I've already had okay. two. Um, so, so, Ronnie, we were talking a little bit uh, before about the difference between uh, how HashiCorp was running the governance for uh, for Terraform and and how so you and with other, all the other maintainers and with the community are running governance for um, the Tofu project. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about kind of how, how you see that impacting being able to leverage uh, the community and um, and all that? Yeah. Um, so as we said, yeah, um, we're really trying uh, to, like we're still kind of figuring it out. Like we, we have processes, I think they're good, but, but we keep um, polishing them and making them uh, much better um, than like when, when it comes to engaging with the community. So I talked a little bit about issues and, and I can also say that we have a, an open Jofu community Slack and we're pretty responsive there. Uh, pretty quickly, you can go there, you can ask whichever question you want. Um, if somebody is working uh, currently on an issue, he can get guidance, he can ask questions. Um, we, we're posting updates there. Uh, obviously, we have like the weekly updates uh, uh, of the core team and the updates of the uh, technical steering committee and their decisions. Uh, yeah, and we also have a public sync every Wednesday that everybody can hop on. Uh, we especially like developers that, that took issues that are working and they're currently contributing. And like you can just hop on and see what we're working about, ask questions. And yeah, even if you have like ideas about the process and about how to make it more uh, engaging with the community, you're more than welcome to, to say to us to suggest. Actually, I love that openness um, because this was completely hidden from the uh, user base. And so forgot about that weekly statement. So where are we? So you release this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks for doing that. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about how the, the TSC works and how differences get, uh, of opinion get resolved, et cetera? Yeah, of course. Um, then sometimes like there are issues that are, are just massive. Uh, they might take a lot of time uh, to, to implement like a new feature. It, it might be a big change uh, in Tofu, and then we, we just decide or we just need some more uh, leadership um, decisions. And then we have an agenda uh, for the technical steering committee, and we, we write it there. And I think they're meeting like once a week, week, twice a week, something like that. Sebastian, you can, you can uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, but yeah, and then they're discussing it and, and uh, telling us their decisions. Uh, we just re recently like opened a, an internal channel. We're, we're, keep, we're still trying to, to create like a really good process also with the technical steering committee. And we have like an internal channel and we're uh, discussing about stuff. They're asking questions, uh, we're responding and uh, yeah, that's how we do it. For now, it like it looks like it's going really well. So I have a uh, few other questions, but uh, I'd like to start opening it up to uh, to the much better questions you guys are going to ask. So we are limited on microphones. So if you have any question, raise your hand, and I'll I'll take your question, repeat it. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep going. Yes, go ahead. Can we import or bring stuff, the, the good stuff from Terracrons? That's a great question. Um, yeah, like that, that's a great question. I, honestly, if, if you want it, like, let's talk about it. Uh, let's see some, some upvotes. Uh, let's get these issues. I don't think we, we actively uh, have, uh, a, like, we're going to do that actively until, the com again, the community will ask for that and then we might might reconsider. Was there particular things you had in mind? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of stuck with Terragrams now uh, for a year now, and I'm trying to actually migrate out of the classes um. to the scale learner. Now, now, now we can uh, do, like, uh, we can use the Tofu library under the hood of Terragrams, which is fine, but uh, I'm kind of stuck now in the loop. I, I want to revert back to like so, just so, so instead of Terragrams, but I'm thinking so 
Can I get a quick show of hands? Who here uses Terragrunts? Okay, so about a, about a quarter to a third. Um, so go for it. Uh, so that's a really interesting question. Um, Terragrunts relationship with Terraform the language. Um, and I think um, there's, there's two ends of that spectrum. There's the, I need things done before Terraform runs, which is essentially Terragrunts significant value. It's awesome tool, it's kind of, it, it's, it really is awesome. Um, and then you've got the cloud proxy approach, which you see in a lot of their, their modules online, and they've taken the opposite approach, which is, uh, don't worry about it, we'll use an awful lot of null resources, and we'll figure out a way. And there's some really clever, creative, awesome stuff in, in those uh, patterns. And what's most interesting is that uh, as a long time user from, from t far too long ago, um, <laughs> is that the, because Terraform as a language itself, because we haven't decided what it's going to be, is it a programming language or is it a puppet-like state, target state definition? We've had to build other capabilities before it runs and things that run under the hood before Terraform actually executes. It's almost as if we needed to be a compiler. We almost need Terraform to be a better compiler tool than it currently is. Uh, more like a, a sort of a fully evolved programming language, more of those capabilities, more of the primitives, more of the conditionals that we expect. And a lot of the, the very basic stuff that we'd like to do that we find ourselves doing in Terragrunt, the the region setting, the, the version pinning, a lot of the very basic stuff that we could also code in Terraform, but because it happens much, much earlier before Terraform actually invokes, the tool doesn't support it yet. So it's, it's really interesting to, to, to have that question be asked in that, it's in, for me, it's another indicator of if the tool could do more, not only in terms of utility functionality for the users, but also in the pre-run, almost like hooks, almost in the same way that Git evolved into have pre-commit, post-commit type hooks. Even if it wasn't going to implement it natively, if it was able to handle that hook and do invocations, it would allow the community to build other tools. Terragon is still an awesome one, but it would allow us to swap in other things. Horrible shell scripts that would do exactly what we needed, but nobody would want to manage those. You really, I like that question, it's good. Uh, do we have another one? Sorry. Do you mind passing the list? Yeah. <laughs> okay, my bad. Which <clears throat> Can you repeat the question? Uh, so if I, I heard it correctly, it's that it's already an existing PR, but uh, is it against the HashiCorp uh, Terraform or is it against the Open Tool Terra, Open Tool Food Terraform? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Kuba, I'm also on the core team. Uh, so there's actually an RFC against Tofu by one of the core team members, which uh, he's very passionate about and is working to push forward for constant, uh, for initialization time evaluation of constant expressions, which more simply means if you use at the beginning constants that just depend on input variables, then you might be able to parameterize the regions, the backends, the module versions, pin the versions. So a lot of those, like for each is on constant arrays, like regions, those, those are kind of things that would be unblocked by that. With support for environment variables, because we all live on environment variables too, right? Are they common to the issue? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, when you talked about the wish list, this is the thing I want to see. Like, yeah. In Open Tofu, I, I think this feature uh, is amazing. It will really uh, let us configure uh, stuff much easily, and we're talking about making the the backend uh, block much more um, um, like you you could use variables and locals, and again, and using it also uh, in source attributes uh, of module blocks. And yeah, this is the one on my wish list. Any other questions? Yep. Okay, I have a ahead. question and I have the mic. Um, um, I, I used to work in Cloud Posse, so I'm a hardcore user of Atmos. Um, I don't know how many people use Atmos here. Maybe I'm the only one? Yes, I'm the only one. <laughs> so in Atmos, one of the, the greatest things is a variable, a variable inheritance. And then the YAML stacks are defined 
and then it creates the Terraform variables out of that. So I always wonder why actually Terraform never had that because it's like, you know, you, you have, for example, tags and then there's a company tags and you want to pass it to the tax variable. Why do you have to redefine them in every environment? It's, so the, to, to, to keep the code dry is very simple in Atmos to just create one YAML uh, file and then inherit that file to every single stack. It could be a whole company with thousands of stacks and you just define it in one place. So I was wondering if there is, should I open an issue for that <laughs> so that it gets uh, implemented or at some point? Uh, or, or, or if you guys ever talk about kind of like variable inheritance or even dynamic variable inheritance. Um, I actually think it's also mentioned as part of the RFC, uh, if I remember cor correctly. Uh, yeah, and, and go to that RFC and just comment on that, say that you want that specific part and we're definitely discussing it. Thank you. Uh, just in relation to your question, um, I would like to see an approach that, that allows a sort of Git-based uh, version of the implementation in that it allows hooks to be pulled in that don't have to be Go-specific. One of the things that I, I love about Terraform the most is also the thing I hate about it the most in that it's a, the barrier is the Go language. And uh, on the earlier talk, I was like, somebody's written a provider in something other than Go. I was like, oh, finally, he's going to say no. He's going to say Python. And then he said, no, we're just digging. We're going further down, guys. We're going down to the bottom. <laughs> Next one's in assembly. Next one's in assembly. Um, <laughs> and I, I think, yeah, maybe, who oh, no. know. Um, but I think what I really like to see is that more and more of the, of the additions that we bake into Tofu, that they allow more languages to be used because there, while Go is great language, uh, it's often the language that is least seen in the people that need to use Terraform the most. Um, especially when you're coming from like a, a web, uh, traditional user development or web development, and it's you know Python and Node feature heavily there. There are a lot of other popular technologies too as well, but I think as we add more features to, to OpenTofu, I would very much like to see it be capable of pulling in more of the same tech and approach patterns like pulling in environment variables or hooks to pull in Python or Node. It would just open it up to a lot more involvement from the, from the community and it would allow us to figure out more of what we need without having to worry of, about finding somebody to write it in Go. Uh, that that touches, touches upon a really interesting point, which is like as platform engineers, you work with a lot of folks that are adopt, like, that are adopting OpenTofu. Where where do you see the friction? Is it the language? Is it the d language versus DSL framework? Is it the what is it? Stephen, you want you want to try to take a stab at that? Yeah. So for me, my my biggest almost barrier to contributing myself is that I don't know Go. So in order to be able to contribute, I'd have to go learn a whole new language, which frankly, I don't always have the time for. Um, so if, as you say, if we can open it up to more languages, I would have tried to solve a lot of the pain points I've had over the, over the time myself. Yeah, I mean, a couple of lines of Python would have fixed that merge, you know, easy. Uh, but yeah, I, exactly that. I think it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, in Go and I think, if we're able to find a way to just hook in other tools, scripts, it will at least allow people to build their own implementation using the language that they know. And answer your question, um, you know, where do we come across it? I think um, what's really interesting about Terraform, the language, is that it is very easy to pick up. Um, but then you reach the point where you begin to treat it like a programming language because it looks and feels it's got awesome docs the docs are there the open tofu docs are good uh, it's got the cli you've got the compiler that's the compiler right then you've got all the other documentation and then all of a sudden you're like this is a programming language i'm going to learn i know this programming language i need to do a condition oh boy is it a count of zero or a count of am i using a ternary or oh for each that'll be easy right oh boy uh and then over we go to ChatGPT and all of the tools that all the LLM based tools that we're all using, we are, it, it, it's helpful. Um, they're all based off very early versions of very old code and at a time when the advice was, don't worry about it, put everything into workspaces. 
It'll be fine. Don't worry about how many environments you destroy. I mean, manage. It'll be perfectly OK, guys. Um, like, I talked a little bit about that before, so I don't think we need to repeat that. But I also like want to say that I was a web developer starting to learn Terraform. And I think that one of the, the main shifts uh, when learning Terraform and now Tofu, that as a developer, you're always trying to, to and, and succeeding, to uh, program uh, stateless uh, applications. And then infrastructure as code is stateful by nature. And I think that's a really like big change for, for a programmer in, when they think about, about what change they're about to do. Now they, think they need to think about the existing infrastructure, how it will affect the, the existing infrastructure. I can't just uh, delete this resource. Like it, will, um, it will just harm like the entire infrastructure. And I really need to understand uh, what happens there. And I, I don't think, like, I, I can't think of a way that changing, like, the syntax will help for that. It just, we still need to do the, the change uh, in the way we think. Yeah, plus, um, to extend on that, um, it's still, it's a cloud world. So you have to understand how AWS, for example, is working under the hood. Um, I mean, creating a database, yes, true, easy. But what do you need else? Uh, what else do you need? You need a network, you need a security group, blah, blah, blah. All of these things. So where's the domain? So I'm a user, I'm a contributor for, to the internal modules, um, for example. So something like that. So talking about entry points. Um, we talked about the um, extending the language by own providers. This is great. It's a great addition. But then again, look at it from the other side, from, the, uh, from your end users. And your end users are the developers, actually, who take the module, who want to create a database So in the end. So you provide the tools to it. But how can that be done? Just saying. So it's two. Mm -hmm. We had a question over here. James, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I may get attacked by this one because I think it's a Twitter argument that pops up every six months or so. Um, and a lot of the conversations that have been going on today have, have already kind of made an assumption that we're going to go down this this programming language introductions of uh, let's add functions, let's add loops, let's add conditionals everywhere. Do you think there's value in doing what HashiCorp did and, and keeping it declarative and keeping it simplified? but uh, somehow integrating tighter with tools such as Terragrun or other templating languages and things like this? Excellent question. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, so for me, um, I like to use Puppet uh, as a good example in that very much so from the outset, uh, they were, uh, this is a DSL, you're going to define your target state and don't get any uh, don't get any illusions about complex programming language. They were very clear from the outset, but what they did manage to do was they iterated on the capabilities within Puppet to build in uh, functionality that users and developers need. And whether it was switching case statements, uh, there's a, a lot of really good examples in Puppet that I would refer to. Um, and their approach has largely been from the same place. We need, it needs to be declarative. We need to have um, some basic support to allow conditions to happen during evaluation at effectively at compile time. Um, and what's really interesting about uh, Puppet is that being written on Ruby, they did lean heavily into that if you want to extend it, you can. You should do it in Ruby, but you don't necessarily have to. And I think um, my answer to, to that question would really be, I would like to follow the model that sort of Puppet Labs have used in that that approach worked well, and they have maintained that healthy balance of user and developer enablement without having to go, oh, we got functions here, guys. You can extend it. You can build your own essentially your own providers, and they've sort of established that healthy, happy medium that seems to support almost all of the use cases. And as evidenced by, um, all of the additions and extensions for Puppet have been in the modules that have been developed and the patterns that have been built. Whereas in, in Terraform, because we haven't had those capabilities early on, 
the entire community has built it at the other side, the, the pre-execution, pre-compiled stage in the likes of Terragrunt, uh, which again, really popular, really awesome. Um, and then at the let's hide it from the user and let's build it in 27 layers of nulls. And as a heavy user of null resources for a long time, I'll, I'll hold on to it with my dying breath. Um, we're running out of time here. Can we get some final thoughts from the other panelists? And then we will have to make time for the uh, lightning talks. Um, final thoughts, yeah. All the best for the community. Do it, enjoy, um, participate, bring PRs, put pressure on the de core developers here, and then let's see where our <laughs> journey continues. Uh, echoing that, um, take part start to learn to complain more about the tools you're using because once you start to complain you can get things fixed the squeaky wheel gets the grease after all that's a really good point yeah yeah and <laughs> um, yeah as as the other guy said the same the same thing but uh, yeah also criticize the way we work the way we work as open tofu and like sit Tell us what you think that's not working. Uh, suggest uh, new new ways and new methods, and we're here to listen. Um, my own perspective would be that I would. The only reason that the Open Tofu initiative really took off was that companies who make money from Terraform were able to fund full-time resources to allow this to happen. We wouldn't be here without it. So, number one, thank you. Um, so for my part, I would like to see more bits that are Terraform adjacent commercialized because ultimately those will fund the things that have value to the community, whether that is tools like Terragrunt that have you know, commercial support. It needs to be okay to, to make money off Terraform, participate in the community. Uh, there was a couple of things that, were, that, that got really, you know, really well, but open community, participation in the community, being involved in that. And, it is very important to be able to generate revenue or money of some sort out of the tools that you build, whether that's to sustain your own sort of hobby uh, that you contribute to Open Tofu, or whether it's that you work for an organization and there's value in doing that. I think it needs to be okay to commercialize some aspects of the supporting uh, ecosystem that, that, that wrap around Terraform. And I'd like to see more of the tools that do that because the ones that do succeed will be the tools that we know we need most. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining the panel and let's uh, give them a big thank you.